Welcome to another video for STAT 212. In this video, we're going to um, turn now to compound probabilities. We're going to look at what happens when we have two events um, that we're kind of looking at at the same time and thinking about probability in that way. So this is important um, in a lot of statistical questions when we're kind of relating two events together and thinking about um, you know the probability of different combinations of things happening. So for example, the, the drug test result that we saw in the last video where we have the positive negative result mixed in with the um, either doing drugs or not doing drugs, that would be like looking at a compound event. So um, when looking at a compound event, a first question that we should ask is whether or not the, the events are disjoint or whether the events seem to be intersecting. Um, so disjoint um, can also be termed mutually exclusive, but it's going to be uh, what happens when the events cannot be true at the same time. In other words, um, there is no outcome such that both events are true. So as an example, we have um, two different events that we've listed here. One is that a randomly selected student is a freshman, and the second is that a randomly selected student is applying for graduation. Um, so I'm guessing these are going to be disjoint events because I don't think we're going to find a student who would say yes to both of those questions. Um, so if that's the case, we might think of this sample space looking like this, where we have students who are going to be freshmen, we're going to have students who are applying for graduation, and then we're going to have some students who are not in either of those circles. So everybody else is going to be kind of out here in the rest of the rectangle. And so the rectangle is going to be like our entire sample space is going to contain everybody, and then we just happen to have two non-overlapping bubbles that we can categorize some students into. So intersecting events are going to be events where there are outcomes in the intersection, right? So if we have the event that a randomly selected student is a freshman and another event that a randomly selected student owns a car, I would expect that we'd find some students who fit both of those circles at the same time, right? So we're going to have freshmen, um, we're going to have car owners, and we're going to have some people who answer yes to both of those. We're also going to have some people who answer yes to just one and people who answer neither, um, or yes to neither, I guess I should say. So now we kind of have four different categories instead of three, so there's really four different bins that we're going to see people in. So kind of like with the, the drug testing example, right, so we had a two-by-two two table, right, so those are kind of like our four different cat categories, just like we see here. We have one, two, three, four different places that people could go. So um, when talking about different sectors, two terms that we're going to very often use are union and intersection. So a union um, of two events is going to be um, the part of the sample space, or it's going to be the event that at least one of these events is, uh, or yeah, one of these events is true. Um, so if we think about union in a general term, right, so it, like a labor union is something that kind of unites people together, right? So think of it as people who are different, they might have different backgrounds, they might have different jobs, um, but they are kind of coming together and banding together for greater strength. So, so think of a union as kind of linking everything together, everything, everybody who's in at least one of these two circles. Whereas an intersection is a little bit more exclusive, right? So you have to be in the center. You have to have both events be true. So you have to be um, um, in the intersection of these two things. All right, so to demonstrate this, uh, I typically use class data. Um, often class data that I would just collect live where people kind of raise their hands and I do a quick count around the classroom. Um, however, I'm going to, oops, I'm going to erase that. Um, however, I'm going to just use some class data that I collected from a previous semester um, where I asked this question. So let's C be the event that a student in our class loves cats and D be the event that a student loves dogs. And let's record our results here. Okay, so the first thing that I'll mention here is um, the choice that I'm going to use to, to re record this. Um, so when I asked it in class, I did not delineate um, the categories. I just said, um, if, you, if you love cats, if you would say that that's true about yourself, raise your hand. And I just counted how many people that was, and it came out to about um, 33. 
And then I did the same thing with how many of you would say that you love dogs, and I got a much larger number. I got 112. Um, and then um, I started delineating, and I asked people, okay, so if you said that, if you would say that you love both cats and dogs, raise your hand. And I got uh, 23. And then how many of you love neither? And I got five people, five very unfortunate people do not love dogs or cats. Um, I myself love cats. Um, I don't think I'd say that I love dogs. I'm, I'm okay with them. I like meeting other people's dogs for a few minutes, um, but I, I don't want to live with a dog. Um, I don't have that much energy. Cats are my, my level of energy, so that's a, a little bit better um, suited for me. Okay. So if I'm thinking about this Venn diagram and, and how I would kind of record this data, um, it's pretty easy to fill in the intersection and then the empty space, right? Because there's 23 people who love both, and then there's five people who love neither. Um, however, I kind of have to parse out the 33 people who said that they love cats because that's going to overlap with the 23 people who said that they love both, right? So it's not 33 unique people. It's... Um, it's going to be 23 people who love both plus 10 additional people who love cats only. Okay, so in that case, um, it looks like we're going to have 33 minus 23 is going to be 10 for cats. So there's 33 people in the cat circle divided into 23 and 10, depending on if it's overlapping with dogs or not. Um, same thing with dogs here. We're going to have to do 112 minus 23. I should show that math up here as well. Um, so 112 minus 23 is going to be, is that 89? Um, so it's going to be, yeah. So that means there's going to be 89 unique dog-only lovers over here. Now, the probability of both events taking place, um, how would we calculate that? So that's going to be these 23 people in the middle divided by the total number of people that I have, which I do have to kind of think through here. So if there's 89 plus 23 plus 10, uh, that's going to be... Let's see, 112, 22, 27 people. So 23 divided by 127, and I get, oops, let me fix that, 123, oops, <laughs> 23 divided by 127. And I get about 18%. Um, the probability of at least one event taking place um, so that's going to be the union, right? So it's going to be everybody who's in at least one category. So that's going to be this 89 plus 23 plus 10. So that's going to be 122 over 127. So that's going to be most of our people. And that comes out to about 0.961, so 96.1%. Now the probability of loving dogs only. So here I'm definitely going to look carefully at my... Uh, Venn diagram. So I'm not going to take this 112 number over here, right? Because that's going to that's including some cat lovers as well. But if I'm looking for people who are dog only lovers, that's going to be this 89 divided by 127, and I get um, 0 0.701, so 70.1 percent. All right, so just kind of a takeaway that I'll mention here is you always want to be careful um, when we're reporting numbers in this situation or representing numbers. Are they representing like this event only or are they representing this event total, right? Because that is going to tell if that number goes here or if that number needs to be divided into two smaller sectors. So always kind of be careful with that. All right, so let's look at some terminology and some probabilities here. So if we're looking for the probability of a union, uh, we would use this union symbol right here. Um, so this kind of, you know, wide U. And that's going to represent the union of, of the events that are being listed. And then the intersection is going to be an upside down U. So it's going to be a little bit more, I, I kind of think of it as being more exclusive, right? So it's kind of like dividing out like just this group right here. I'm containing it, whereas union is more um, inclusive, I would say. It's kind of more open. Um, so that's how I kind of keep the two straight in my head. And if we're looking with um, probabilities for unions, that's usually pretty straightforward. 
um, especially if they're disjoint, because if two events are disjoint and I'm looking for the union, I'm just going to add the two probabilities together, right? So if I'm looking at a situation like this, and I'm looking for what is the union of these two events, it's just going to be the probability that somebody is a freshman plus the probability that somebody is applying for graduation, because I don't have to worry about an intersection there. I know that those two individual probabilities will add up to the total uh, without any worry of an overlap there. However, if I have intersecting events, I need to be a little bit more careful because if I just add the probability of A and the probability of B when these two events are overlapping, then I'm going to do this circle plus this circle, but that's going to be more than just the union. That's the union with a sector being double counted, right? So if I add these two individual circles up, then I'm going to count the middle twice in that case. So that's why formally what I want to do is I want to subtract out the intersection if I add up the two events like that when there's an intersection. However, in the first case, since there's no intersection, I don't have to worry about double counting an intersection because there is no intersection. So let's take a look at some examples. You might even try these on your own first just for practice, and then I'll go over them here. If you're rolling a single die, let a sub 1 be the event of getting a 1 or a 2 on your first roll, and let a sub 2 be the event of getting a 4, 5, or 6 on your first roll. What is the probability of a or b? Um, so first, I'll just kind of point out um, we can use notation here. So the probability of a or b is really asking about the probability of a union b. Um, assuming this or means that both of them can be true, which, which typically that's that's what people mean in probability when they say that. Um, so if we tr turn this into probability of A union B, then we can add up the probability of A, or A1, I guess. It's going to be two options out of six. And the probability of A sub 2 is going to be three options out of six. Now, these are disjoint events. So A1 and A2 are disjoint because there is no overlap, right? There is no value that I can roll such that both of these events are true at the same time. So that means that I can just do probability of A union B is just going to be, oops, I'm sorry, this is um, A1 and A2. Going to be the probability of a1 plus the probability of a2 and no concern for an overlap here. And that should make sense if we think intuitively about what we're doing here, right? So we're really just asking what's the prob probability that we get a 1, 2, 4, 5, or 6. So that should come out to about five, a five out of six chance, or should it should just come out to it, not, not about, it should come out to five out of six in this case. All right, so we have another question here. Uh, we're rolling a die, and let a sub one be the event of getting a one, two, or three, and let a sub two be the, be the event of getting a two, three, or four. What is the probability of A or B? Again, I'll change this to um, the probability of A union B. So um, now these events, though, are not disjoint. These are definitely intersecting. Oh, and you know what? Again, I'm doing this all over the place. I keep calling these B instead of A1 and A2. I guess I'll correct that once and for all there. So A1 and A2 are intersecting events. And that definitely informs how we go about this problem. Because since there's an intersection, we can't just add up the events separately and call it a day. We have to add them up, but make sure that we take out an intersection, because otherwise we'll double count it. So the probability of A1 is going to be 3 out of 6, right? So 1, 2, or 3. And the probability of A2 is also going to be 3 out of 6 because that's going to be 2, 3, or 4. However, the probability of A interse or A1 intersect A2 
appears to be two out of six because two and three are gonna fit both of those events. So then the probability of A union, or A1 union A2 is going to be the probability of A1 plus the probability of A2 minus the probability of the intersection. And that's going to be three out of six plus three out of six minus two out of six is going to be four out of six. Sorry if that's written very sloppily at the end. Let me um, make that a little bit nicer. Sometimes I get really excited when I'm writing and then it just falls apart because I'm writing too hard. Okay, I did that in class once where I was like, like writing with the chalk and then like next thing I know, like slam the, slam the chalk and like the chalk breaks because I, I guess I was just thinking way too much about what I was writing. Um, but I can't quite do that with, with, uh, with my stylus, but um, I, can, I can make it much, I still made it like super messy. I don't know what I'm doing here. Um, for, I'm also like writing right at the edge of my pad, so that, that's also my excuse here. Um, but yeah, ho hopefully with, with all that, that, the answer does make sense though. Okay, let's do one more contextual example. So dice, we did those because that's easy to think about, right? So you can kind of think through conceptually what we're doing and why it makes sense. Now let's do an example that we don't have that advantage to. So a doctor is trying to help a patient with the flu by prescribing a medication. However, this doctor knows that 5% of patients experience an allergic reaction and 10% experience stomach pain. This also includes 2% of patients who experience both of these side effects together. What is the probability that this patient will have at least one of these symptoms if taking this medication? So at least one, uh, that sounds like a union, right? So the union of these two side effects is what we're trying to calculate, the probability that at least one of them takes place. Okay, so let's go ahead and call uh, the allergic reaction event A. So the probability for event A is going to be um, 0 0.05. The probability for stomach pain, I'll call it event S, is going to be 0 0.10. And the probability of both of these happening together is going to be A intersect S is going to be 0 0.02. So then the probability of A union S, by now, if, if you haven't already tried to do this on your own, Pause it right now and make sure you can do this, otherwise I'll do it, um, is going to be one plus the other minus the intersection. So 0 0.05 plus 0 0.10 minus 0 0.02, and that's gonna be 0.13. I'll also go ahead and draw a picture if that helps. I'm sure these bubbles are way too big. Um, actually, they're not big enough because I can't draw them at intersection. Uh, let me do this. Really, I shouldn't do circles. Circles are kind of hard to draw in. So if this is allergies and this is stomach pain, then there's going to be a 0.02 probability of both of those taking place. However, the whole allergy bubble should add up to 0.05. So I'm not gonna write 0.05 in this place. I'm gonna write 0.03 because that's a number that makes this circle add up to 5%. Same thing with stomach pain where it's not gonna be 10%, it's going to be 8% because the whole circle should add up to 10%. So that means that the union here is gonna be 3% plus 2% plus 8%, or you could also say it's 10% plus 5% minus the 2% that gets twice counted in that situation. So that's where we get to 13% here.